the guys from Ping, they've kind of shown me how much the equipment matters. I just love that I can hit any shot I kind of want. We're going to be able to tell some fun stories about what goes on here to help golfers play better golf. Welcome back to the Ping Proving Grounds podcast. I'm Shane Bacon. That is Marty Jertson. We are in the Ping Tour truck, Marty. Tony Finau is joining us. How about Tony. that? Welcome. What's up? Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, Tony, I want to get into a lot of stuff with you because I'm very interested in your life. And I, I feel like I've heard adjacent stories about the Tony Finau experience, but I don't know if I've ever really like solidified how it all went down. You turned pro at 17. Yeah, that's right. And and you, I mean, you turned pro because you had this opportunity to make a lot of money in Vegas. <laughs> Were you playing competitive golf? Like, how did that whole thing go down? Yeah, I mean, I was playing competitive golf, but I wasn't playing professional golf. Right. You know, I was playing junior golf. I was 17 years old. Um, basically what happened was, um, I had an opportunity to play in this ultimate game. They called it, which was like a high stakes game. How'd you get in? How'd you get invited? Yeah, I got invited by, uh, someone in Utah reached out to my dad. My brother and I were, I would say popular golf figures and just in Utah, right. um, being standout golfers in Utah, but you know, someone had reached out and said that they would fund us playing in that tournament. You know, I, I think it was like $50,000 some just to get in. And he was interested in funding both my brother and I to play in the tournament. And if you get to the final 12 guys, then you have to make a choice at that time if you wanted to win the $2 million, which is at the end of the tunnel, if you won the whole thing. Um, so my dad pitched it to my brother and I. I didn't know how I felt about it, but my dad was like, well, we're going to do it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, made for yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so we entered the tournament and... Lo and behold, I was one of the final 12 guys. I won my first two matches uh, pretty convincingly. And so then I was I had a 1 12th chance, if you will, to win $2 million, which at that time, this is in 2007. You know, we're playing for $2 million now, but right. this is, I mean, we're almost talking 20 years ago I now. mean, the PJ Tour, the, the yeah. end of the season wasn't winning that yeah, much. Yeah, exactly. Right? You know, so obviously a lot of money. I didn't come from money. And so basically, when we were faced with that choice, I had already verbally committed to play at BYU, play college golf at BYU so my dreams and everything were to play golf but I knew I wasn't ready to play professional golf you know I wanted to um, but anyways we had a meeting with my parents you know my seven siblings and myself and um, because this is a big choice you know a lot of my family sacrificed a lot for me and my parents definitely but they basically were like what do you want to do and I was like well I'm going to college you know and, and that's how I feel about it and and again, my parents were like, yeah, nice try, but you're not. <laughs> you're, you're actually going to turn pro and you're going to try and win $2 million. So that's uh, that's pretty much how it happened. And I ended up playing in the event. And the cool thing about that was I you know, I made friends with some guys that are still on tour. Scott Piercy won. Okay. I played in a group with uh, Kevin Strillman. Mm. Uh, Spencer Levine was also in the field nice. of the final 12. Um, I'm missing somebody else that's uh, a, a prominent figure out here. But anyways, I made some friends there, but... After that, I was on my way, you know, and uh, it's been a heck of a journey being 17 years old playing, uh, for you $2 know, million. yeah, playing for $2 million is one thing. And then my life, uh, you know, I had to mature fast as a 17 year old, but that's how, that's how, that's the story of me turning pro. When, when you were, th when you get to 12 and you're having these, as a 17 year old, you're having these like pretty intense conversations with your family. I could only imagine what was the level of pressure you were feeling knowing that if I can go on and win this thing, it's going to yeah. change my entire family's life forever. I mean, I'm assuming that had to have weighed heavy on the shoulder. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. You know, I think uh, there was definitely some pressure there. I look back now, and um, but it, it's all grooved me to be the person and player that I am today. You know, again, coming from uh, um, very little as far as financial status, that was an opportunity to um, to kind of take our family out of the out of the hole and and move forward in life. But uh, all those experiences, all those experiences early in my career, um, just molded me into maturing and being the person and player that I am today. Tony, what else was there between that event and getting to the tour that, that, we, that we didn't see on Netflix? You yeah, know, because I yeah, love—I well, don't know about you, Shane. I love watching. Yeah, your Tony story on Netflix. What else was in there, man? I know we played in some of the same mini tours yeah. for a while. Seen your name around Arizona golf, yeah. a lot of Monday qualifiers, the big break. What, what was kind of what else was between there on that journey? Yeah, I mean all of that, you know. But basically, six years of mini tour life and mini tour golf, you know. And and in those six years, I got married and had two kids in that in that time frame. So. A lot happened in my personal life. Um, a lot happened in my professional life. You know, I was trying to. Every year, I went to qualifying school and yeah. failed. You know, I went um, through qualifying school six years in a row and never got through second stage. You know, I would get Ooh. through first and not get through second. I wouldn't even get through first one of the years. I would get through first again, not get through second. So, um, 
Yeah, but you know, I, in two thousand in two thousand thirteen, I finally got through qualifying school, and and I'm asked all the time like. What's your greatest accomplishment in golf? You know, I get asked all that all the time now, having won, you know, PGA Tour events and, and done some pretty cool things. And I would say in 2013, getting past second stage, I knew that there was light at the end of the tunnel because I was like, now I'm going to have a chance to actually do something with my career. Yeah. You know, like playing mini tour golf is not a glamorous, like, PGA Tour life. <laughs> you know, it's like sleeping in your car. I mean, you guys have heard it and I've done all of it, right? Um, staying at super suspect hotels sometimes you're staying <laughs> like I, I played canadian tour in 2013 before you know fall came around and played q school and i had some friends i mean we would stay three four of us in one room you know i've been fort you know fort knox one year you know me and my buddy stayed in our car right so all of those stories are in those six years are what i went through you know and i was doing that with a wife and two kids so you know obviously the pressure at that time was pretty extreme but you know, before I married my wife, I basically told her, I was like, look, like I'm, I'm riding this thing to the wheels fall off, honey. There ain't nothing, there ain't, there ain't nothing else that I know how to do. So, this is so my this, craft. This is it right here. So if, if I'm the one that you want to be with, just know that, you know, this is the, this is what we're doing. So I obviously I have an amazing wife and you guys saw that on, on Netflix full swing, you know, she's unbelievable. So she's been super supportive and, um, I wouldn't have been able to do it without her, you know, just the support that she's had back at home, taking care of the kids while I'm trying to pursue my career but that's what those six years were like you know it's extremely hard and um i look back now and it's like again that's what made me you yeah. know like i've gone through a lot on the pga tour and i feel like i've proved myself continue to prove myself but the hardest times of my career were to get here yeah you know it wasn't yeah. to learn how to win it wasn't all these other stuff because this is a different type of pressure that we're dealing with to me that was like real life pressure i've got kids to take care of i've got a wife to take care of so it's a whole different pre type of pressure that i'm dealing with now than than i was during those six years of just trying to be somebody yeah tony where was that second stage what court and how close were you that year yeah it was at plantation preserve is okay. in fort lauderdale golfers second remember stage. everything oh yeah, yeah. No, I golfers can't forget my, my wife yeah my wife reminds me of that all the time like i forget <laughs> everything she's like well you always remember your golf stuff <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But yeah, Plantation Preserve, um, I was in by a couple shots going to the final round. Um, and I knew, you know, I ended up shooting 69 in the, in the final round and I ended up getting in, I think, by whatever it was, five. You know, I was comfortably okay. okay. I was comfortably in. I, mean, I might have got in by even more than that, but I was comfortably in. So it was a great it was a great feeling yeah, finally nice. to be able to break through after just heartache and disappointment of not feeling like, uh, you know, I was living up to the level that I should be playing playing to but it mm -hmm. it also just tells you how hard it is to to make it to the pga tour i think there's a lot of great players um that just haven't taken advantage of the opportunity and that unfortunately aren't playing the pga tour but they're amazing golfers yeah but you know you you have i think a small window of opportunity got to jump through and luckily for me i was able to do it finally on my seventh try tony when you when you go back to those years, those six, seven years you're playing Gateway Tour, and yeah. you know you're getting married, you have kids, you're, you're telling your wife like this is what I'm doing. <laughs> were there moments, and I can imagine there were probably a lot of moments where you were doubting, is this what I'm going to do for a living? Did you have a, mo a close call where you said, okay, at the end of 2011 or 2010, if it doesn't, if I don't make enough money or if I don't get through this, maybe I will try to pursue something else. Was there ever a moment where you were thinking that, or was it yeah. always I can improve, I can get better? And when, yeah. when, where was that moment where you saw that sign? Like, oh, okay, I, I'm, I'm close. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. You know, I think I can't say that I ever considered doing anything else. Okay, that, that I can say for certain. Again, you know, I, I, some, from the time I was eight years old, pretty much on, I wanted to be a professional golfer, and I, and my whole life was wrapped around this idea that I would, and belief that I could do it, and the work ethic was there to back it up. So, I still had enough results in junior golf. Um, I feel like, and in the professional game, you know, I was still winning mini tour events to tell myself that I could do it. So I think it was still more um, when, not if, you know, in those situations. And so luckily for me, I think I was just stubborn enough the way I see it. I was just stubborn enough to to think that I was going to be a great player in this game, you know, and, and whether people were telling me that or not. And obviously when you're 17 years old, like me in Utah, First of all, Utah is not a place that you're going to say one of the best players in the world is going to come out of this right, state. Right, right, yeah, right. That's that's the first thing. And the second thing is not a seven, especially not a 17 year old. You know, we we've heard some of the stories of, of kids that have turned pro too young, but 
to me, it was like, it was more that I I had the stubbornness and belief that I could do it, you know, and that's, that was more important to me than what anybody else could tell me at that time. So I, I honestly can, can say there wasn't too much doubt. It was most of it, it was hard, but there was nothing else I would rather do than pursue this golf thing and try and make it and trying to be the best golf player that I could be. So, um, again, I was fortunate that I had, I have a wife that supports me and through those trials and we're on this side of it now and, and we have a whole different set of trials, but that part of, of the life was, uh, was something that's pretty crazy. And I would say to answer your, the other part of your question, I think, uh, you know, in 2018, it's hard for me to get away from this. Uh, anytime you talk about my ankle, everybody's like, right, right, right. I feel like I came on the scene mostly because of my ankle. Um, but in 2018, my first Masters, I watched my first Masters in 1997, and I finally qualified for my first Masters in 2007, so 17. So 20 years later, I'm finally playing in the Masters, a tournament that I had watched my whole life. Couldn't wait to play in it. On the eve of that, it happens to my ankle. I end up finishing in the top 10. And so I think like my whole mindset shifted to like, if I, if I could do that in a major championship on a bad wheel and just have the fortitude to finish and play that well, like that was like a turning point in my career. I had already won on the tour, had some nice results and stuff, but I think that truly changed. And then I got picked to play on the Ryder Cup team that year. I had a winning record in the Ryder Cup overseas. Like there were just things that stacked up, I think, to allow me to, believe that I could take my game, continue to progress. So I would say that that was like a, a true turning point in my life. When people, if you don't play well on a Sunday at a major, or let's say you struggle at a Ryder Cup or, 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 or a big event, right? Yeah. And you hear critics or people that talk about golf like us say, you know, maybe the pressure got to them. Do you laugh at that considering <laughs> the amount of pressure you had felt as you built up to this point? Knowing that yeah. you know you're, you're you're supporting a family and yeah, yeah. you're supporting your family and your parents at times, like I can only imagine the level of pressure you felt in 2011 yeah. and 2010 when nobody knew who Tony Finau was. <laughs> it, it, it probably you know it, yeah. I mean, it can only matter it overshadows everything we're feeling. Hundred right percent. Life is all about perspective, and the perspective that I have, um, you know, most people have a perspective of you from a bird's eye view. You know, when they come down to the ground and actually understand what what the the journey that you've actually been through and been on then then it's not really about what people are saying up here you know it's just mostly about for me how do i get better and, and move forward again that that's it i go back to that stubbornness and that belief i have to be stubborn enough to just think that i can do great things you know whether it's going to happen or not i think it, it, there is that level of stubbornness and belief but um yeah you know critics are, are part of sports right there there's no way around it and we live in an era social media era that <laughs> is crazy everybody has an opinion about you um but that's what i signed up for i wanted to be mm. under the spotlight i wanted lights on me i wanted people to see my game i want people to watch me and if i if people aren't criticizing what i'm doing then i'm not doing really anything right, right. so i i understand that and you know it just comes with the territory you know and and i think some people look at it a negative thing to me it's it's all positive because it's like I'm doing something with my life. You know, I, I didn't come from a lot. I, a lot of times I look at myself, I shouldn't really be here. Right. Like there's so many obstacles I had to overcome just to be in this place right now. So there's not a lot that can be said about me to me that will really rattle me just because of what I've been through. Um, and another big part of that also is my dad. My dad was my biggest critic. He was my coach mm. for the first, you know, dozen years of my, uh, of my career and of my life. And, there's not a lot that he hasn't said to me that somebody else can't say that'll that'll make me feel a certain way about myself. So he pushed me to a level to get to get me to where I am. And and so, you know, you tried you try to stay bulletproof through it all as much as you can. We're only human. You know, I'm going to hear things that I don't want to hear about myself. I'm sure I'm going to hear things. People tell me things that I can and can't do. But it's part of it's part of this experience that I'm having through through the journey and. It it all just is part of the part of the process of being better and becoming better. Tony, do you ever do you ever get burnt out? Like, oh man, I played a lot of golf or things aren't going my game good in my <laughs> game. I need to take some time off. To me, on the outside looking in, it looks like you're kinda like John Rom, like after he won the Masters, like I'll be chipping and putting tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> and when your yeah. kid when you won in Mexico, we saw you that video you out caddying with yeah. your, your kids after that. I mean, are you just is it just golf junkie or do you ever get burnt out and uh, need to take a little breather? 
No, I, I, I love playing golf. I, I enjoy playing it. And now that my son plays, um, it's hard for me to not be on a golf course, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I'll even say to myself, you know, I'm not going to play this fall, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, You're my like, wife, my wife just like rolling her eyes, like, here we go again. Right. You know, I, I enjoy playing. I enjoy the competition. I enjoy the juices and what it brings out of me. And so just for that purpose. And, um, I, I fell in love with this game playing in the evening with my dad and my brother with nobody else around. So I just, I think I truly respect the game for what it is, yeah. you know, and the, the challenge that it is and the beauty that it presents at every turn and the tragedies that it you know presents i i truly enjoy the game i can't say uh i'm, I'm like a swing junkie you know I'm, I'm studying golf swings and i know that much about the history of the game but i truly love playing golf you know like i enjoy it um i'll take some time off when i feel like um i do need to and sometimes it's more of a mental yeah. mental thing than physical you know it's not like i'm tired physically it's like i could use a, a few days off you know just to reset my mind because when you do it for a living, it's a whole different, there's a whole different vibe that comes with it, you know? And, and if you don't have the same perspective that you've had since you were a kid of just trying to enjoy it, yeah. so sometimes you just have to take a few days off and, and recognize the blessing that it is to be playing the game and, and then you get right back after it. Yeah. You talk about playing golf with your, with your brother and with your dad growing yeah. up. And you say you love the game, playing golf. I mean, you play competitive golf. You got fans out there. Some yeah. say normal stuff. Some say not so normal stuff. You have to deal with all of that. Yeah. Is your happiness on the golf course now playing with your son? Is that when you're, you know, 10 out of 10 in terms of loving the game? Yeah, no doubt. You know, my happiness is being with my family, no question, no matter what we're doing. But being on a golf course with my son is the greatest time. I think it's the coolest thing that he loves what I love authentically. You know, like he's been around the game since he was a right. ba- baby. I have some great pictures of him sitting on the range with me while I'm hitting in the mini tour events, right? I mean, whether we're in Chicago, driving through Illinois, you know, a lot of these mini tours we were playing, he would just be sitting right next to the golf balls while I'm grinding away. But he's been around the game his whole life. So he just organically, I think all of our our first heroes are our fathers if they were around. I was the same way. And so my oldest son is the same way. He grew up watching me do this golfing. And so organically, he's now loves the game. He, He plays in tournaments. And it's some of the greatest moments of my life, just being out there playing with him. And um, it's almost like deja vu. I was with my dad and now, you know, it's it's kind of like a full circle moment. It's, it's weird, by the way. I just want to say this, being a parent, when you still feel young <laughs> and then you have moments where exactly. you're like, I'm doing this for yeah, this yeah, person. Exactly. Like then you my, recognize, you know, yeah. and sometimes you're like, I'm not supposed to be this old. Like I'm this old, kid's yeah. looking at me, you know, yeah. it's just so strange that's that it does right. actually happen like that. That's happens right. quick to it. That's Tony, right. Are you more nervous if let's say you got a 12 footer to win a tournament or you're, you, you're a spectating your kid. And he's got a 12 footer to win the tournament. <laughs> yeah. I'm a lot more nervous watching than I am playing. Yeah, I have, yeah. You have, <laughs> you have more control over when you're playing. You don't have any control when you're watching. So, I definitely felt that. I get asked that quite a bit when I'm out watching, and yeah. and, and people ask me that, and I'm, there's no question. I'm way more nervous watching my son than I am playing. Tony, you're 52nd on the PGA Tour this year in driving distance. We all know your golf swing. We all know it's pretty short. It's been built for efficiency. Yeah. If you wanted to be number one in driving distance on the PGA Tour, could you be? Yeah, I could be number one if I wanted to be. Um, do you, my do you accuracy have like, do you would, have that swing? Like, is it still accuracy, there? Yeah, 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 my accuracy would go down quite a bit. <laughs> well, yes. But if I if I only had the goal of being number one in driving distance, I 100 percent could be. Um, but I'm more interested in scoring <laughs> and and playing within myself than I am uh, in driving. You know, driving the golf ball. I, I'll let it. I'll let it go every now and again. But um, most of the time, my swing is just more about efficiency than it is about power when did that switch when did when did you realize that you needed to be more efficient with the golf swing i mean you're a big guy you're a strong guy you're tall you can obviously get it way out you got long arms yeah but i mean the golf swing a lot like john rom who i know you play a decent amount of golf with there's efficiency built into that golf swing way more than everything else you'd want to maybe chase yeah no question I, i i found it out right after my first year on the pga tour i got away with uh hitting it offline on the corn ferry tour Mm. and playing out of the rough. You could play out of the rough on the corn right. tour. I learned real fast. You can't play out of the rough and compete at a high level on the PGA Tour. That was the difference. This rough is thick. Yeah, you know, you actually sometimes had to hack out, and you can't hit the green, right? So um, after the first year, I, I could have been dead last in driving accuracy. I think I was either first or second in distance and almost dead last in accuracy. So um, my coach, Boyd Summerhays, and I 
attack that. And he was straight up with me. He said, look, if you don't learn how to drive the ball straight or Tony, you're just not going to be a great player. You know, you can't, you can only play so well from where you're playing from. You're playing as good as you can from the places you're playing from. And I, and I grew up scrambling, you know, that's, that was a good thing about hitting it offline is I always hit offline since I was a kid. I hit it far, but I hit it everywhere. Yeah. So I learned how to scramble, but I needed to hit it in the fairway to compete at a high level. So that's, that's why, um, and I, it wasn't intentional that I shortened my backswing. It was just, I started to hit a little low fade the second year, the third year. And I ended up learning like, Oh, I think I still hit it far enough and I don't have to worry about smashing it every hole. Right. So my mindset started to change throughout the seasons on the PGA tour. And that's pretty much it. And now it's brought me to today where, um, I just try to continue to learn and groove, groove my, my action. Marty, I know you're obsessed with like the golf swing and diving into golf. Yeah. I know you're an athlete and you're a sports fan as well. When you want, when I watch Tony hit drives, it feels like LeBron level, you know, LeBron jumps in the air, he's going to lay it up and then he, you know, finishes around the rim or like judge yes. you know, judge kind of makes a pretty good swing at a ball. And all of a sudden it's in the upper deck. Totally. Just that like flick motion that Tony has at the golf ball doesn't feel like it's going to go 320. yet. It's still obviously it's has still out there. 178. Right, that's what I'm saying. Ball I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it's still plenty far for PJ exactly. tour standards. Yeah. It was fun a couple of years ago. You were having fun in Utah, cranking some up. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm carrying some about 400. Right? Yeah, so that's right. It's still in there. Oh yeah, it's still in there. If you need it. But it's a good example of there's that, you know, to 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 play the type of golf which is your goal and you and Boyd worked on. There's a sweet spot there. Like you only need to hit it far enough, and then it's about managing it. And and you guys really, um, you know, traveled that journey really well. One of the things, Tony, we you know from your stats, I don't even know if you know this or not is that you are the best player in terms of like proximity to the whole strokes gain from the rough, right? So, uh, you know, you talked about growing, you know, kind of scrambling <laughs> and scoring. What do you think gives you that advantage? Long arms? Do you think it's like your your swing plane, your speed? Do you think you read the lies well? Yeah, I would I would, I would say it's the last one. I, I read the lies really? well. I think yeah. I, really, I, I know, I have not know exactly, but I have, I have a good understanding, I think, how the golf ball is going to come out just by looking at the lie yeah. and getting over it. Um, so I didn't know that stat. Um, I can't say it's super surprising, though, again, but mostly just because I, I grew up not hitting it straight. So I, I think I had to learn how to hit it out of rough. Not that it was PJ Tour rough, but I did learn how to hit out of long grass and yep. how to escape, hit under trees and, and work the ball and stuff like that. And I had to because I didn't hit it very straight. So, But it's worked out to my advantage because now that I hit it straighter, I, I, I'm never concerned when I hit it offline because I, I know how to recover. I've been doing that since I was a kid, right? Mm -hmm. So um, learning how to score, I, I would say, is is the greatest skill in golf is is scoring, you know, having the ability to score. You know, a great swing is one thing and a great putting stroke and, and all those things. But the ability to score is what the game is all about. Yeah. You know, how, yeah. can you score when you're not playing well? And if you can, then, you know, that's, that's a good thing. And I, I would say for the most part, I just learned how to score because of, how I grew up playing the game. I just learned how to smash it and find it and try and get it as close as I can. There was ne never really any technical thoughts or anything. And now that I'm starting to learn and start starting to groove it, um, I'm starting to become a more complete player. Um, and that's the great thing I would say about golf in general. It, this is such a long journey of becoming a great player. You know, you can be your best in your 20s. Yeah. You can be your best in your 30s. And guys have already shown us Stuart Sink, Lucas Glover, you can and VJ Singh, you VJ, can be your best yeah. in your forties. So you don't know where on that thirty year path you're gonna be your greatest. So to me it's like just try to keep grooving and, and keep getting better at what I'm good at and and then hopefully my peaks are really good. And to me I feel like I've you know, I hit a peak last year where I won like four times in a year and and I think I'm starting to find my groove at this age in my career. I've learned a lot about myself and um, and about my game. And and I think that my peak is in front of me more so than I, I, I feel like some of the greats of our game. It's behind them. You know, yeah. I think yeah. for me, it's actually forward because of the journey that I've been on and all of the, you know, heartaches of just getting to the tour. I feel like my best golf is in front of me. You mentioned Boyd. I mean, you've worked with him for a long time. Yeah. He's your swing coach, but he feels like way more than a swing coach. What is that relationship like, not just with Boyd, but with the entire Summer Hayes family? Yeah, it kind of took me by storm. I hired Boyd, and uh, he was just, uh, uh, you <laughs> know, just barely. Storm. Yeah, well, he was <laughs> just like, oh, barely wow. even he was barely even coaching for like a year, 
And then, uh, but we, we've become great friends. He's one of my closest friends. Uh, we basically call each other family now, and I've kind of taken his kids under my wing. We played a lot of rounds together with Preston and Grace and Cam. Um, great kids, and they've done the same thing with my son in return, which is kind of a cool thing. But uh, to see their success, and Boyd's been a great coach. He's been a great mentor. I've I've never really had a short game guy. I, I don't have one guy for uh, different parts of my game. It's yeah. just Boyd. Yeah. Um, and that's worked for me. You know, I, it, for other guys, you know, they'd like – other things and that's again things that i've just learned being out here everybody does it different everybody thinks different everybody feels different they some guys need a guy to do all the things and um i felt like i've felt like throughout my career you know boyd's been um enough and he's done a great job of just just again on my journey you know this is it's not a like a sprint you know golf is such a marathon mm. that you know sometimes people can look at a certain player and say how come this guy is not as good as this guy or you know, and as they say, comparison is like the biggest thief of joy. So it's easy to compare yourself to other guys, but it's not really that. It's like, I think I'm better today and this year than I was last year. And so that's actually what you're trying to do is just be better than yourself and keep chasing that instead of chasing like other stuff. So I think, but Boyd's been a great addition to that. Yeah, Tony, when we talk about Boyd and, and you and your relationship with him, you know, a lot of our fit, fitters out there yeah. talk about, well, you know, f how do you marry fitting and coaching together? It's like yeah. one of the biggest questions. Should I fit the player for the sw swing they have today or the swing we want them to have? I think a few examples from you is you've changed, like, for example, your lie angle and your irons yeah. by close to two degrees over a couple yeah. of years here. Yeah. Is Boyd coming in saying, hey, let's change your irons and change your swing at the same time? Like, what comes first? Do you tweak your irons? Yeah. Are you tweaking your swing? Are you doing it both? What's that? What's that been yeah, like? Yeah, so Boyd's been uh, great in teaching me this. Equipment always comes first. And what that means is let's make sure that it's not the equipment. The equipment is performing before we make changes. Mm, yep. You know, so like if I'm hitting a ball consistently with too much spin, is it the shaft? Is it the, we, let's make sure that we're dialed in on that first. Yes. It's always equipment, you know? And so that's why it's so important to be with a equipment company that is the best, you know, like, and you truly believe in their product and the team that you're working with yeah. to where you tell them what you're feeling and they can come and say, oh, well, we got these options. This is what we think and work with them. Right. And that's where yeah. ping has been amazing for me. I've been with you guys since 2017 and yeah. it's like a family vibe. You know, I'm very comfortable being open with you guys. Hey, yeah. I'm, I'm totally. driving. My, my driver is spinning right now. You know, and just a couple of weeks ago, I had this conversation with KL, you know, I was like yeah, a little bit spinny. I, I may not be swinging as hard as I was a couple of years ago yep. when we had this shaft. So maybe I can try another, a couple other shafts. Right. So equipment is like at the very top and that's, that's where Boyd has taught me a lot because I, again, just coming from not a lot and I think whatever there was, I played. I, when I was a kid, it was like I, I was playing five different irons from different companies. I mean, it yep. was like whatever <laughs> balls I found in the trees, right? It was like, like a played against and it's always, bag. Yeah, 100%, yeah, yeah. right? Like a totally mixed bag. Like sometimes, you know, I, I, I never had the same clubs, but I've had to change my mindset into, okay, let's make sure the equipment fits the style I like to play. And then it is about you. Yeah, but equipment equipment is like at the very top when it comes to like fitting stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think a few fun examples. One, number one, you're the best player out here out of the rough. Maybe that's <laughs> new news. You and use our blueprint iron. Yeah, that iron's very small, heel to toe. Yes, and that's something we always talk about when we're designing. Is hey, because we're playing Arizona golf, not a lot of rough. It's hard for us to relate to the. Then you get out here, Shane playing in the <laughs> Play USA Cherry Hills. Yeah. Yeah. Wait like, a minute, oh, I haven't seen this, this is rough, rough before. Yeah, yeah. How important that is, yeah, right? 100%. So, I mean, you're a great example of that. And then working on your line angle. And then even with your putter, yeah. right? You and Boyd have worked a lot on your setup. 100%. And we even designed a special feature in iPing yeah. for you that That's has right. that, that moves the bubble level. That's right. You know, which yeah. is really fun. Tony Serrano's you guys been great on. there. He's so, it's been, it's been that relationship of the fitting, yeah. setup. How important, what's that uh, PLD? Uh, and we, we designed, and you helped design the yeah. answer 2d and working yeah, so with Tony cool. on that. So yeah, what has that process been like? Tony's been great. Um, when I switched to the PLD, um, I got, yeah, a lot of times you don't get immediate results, but I did get immediate results mm -hmm. within the first couple of months. I had one again after a long drought, um, and then I've been on a nice little run, but, uh, 
I've been very open with Tony on how I how I feel with the putter, and he's been able to mold and shape the putter to exactly how I want it, which is uh, which is invaluable. You know, when yeah. you're playing for the amount of money, the legacy, the you know, there's so much on the line for us each week. Each week we have an opportunity to change our life, and that starts from these little things. You know, how do I get better? And and so having a team again like Tony and Ping around every week to help me groove it is like super cool but to be able to like have the model fit my putting stroke i think is extremely important yeah, that you know? 2d stands for deep like it's yeah, a deep version it's a of the deeper, answer yeah. and that's what you were looking for like hey give me this thicker, answer tony and... i'm saying i wanted a little thicker sole yeah than just a regular answer yeah and that's exactly what i have yeah. uh, in mind now what are some features on there you've you've used uh tony on the uh to help you with setup Right. Yeah, I think one of the most important things in putting is being set up to it the same way. Um, so to help me with face aim, I actually put an arrow right underneath on the bottom of the heel, and I want the arrow to be facing right in the middle of my stance. You know, and so that's when I know the face is square. Okay. If the arrow is facing to my left foot or to my right foot, I un- I know where the f- the face is, and so I think face aim, especially on short putts, is extremely important. So we added a line there, and then I also have a line right over the top of the shaft. So my tendency is my hands to get a little too low. I like them low, but there is a, you know, for me, there's still a such thing as that's too low. Yeah. And if I see too much of the white, then I know my hands are starting to get too low. So there's just a couple of things there that we've added um, to help me with my setup. Yeah. You talked about your relationship with Ping. I yeah. Mean, you, you came out on tour. You were a Nike golf guy. Yeah. Nike golf goes away. <laughs> so now you're a free agent. Yeah. How did your relationship kick off with Ping? Yeah. So I never hit a, hit a Ping club in my life. Okay. Um, this is 27, this is, 16, 27, this is, this is 2017. Okay. Um, I take that back. I had the, I had the old one ping. I two one iron <laughs> oh, nice. and I had that. And I, I used to go one driver, iron. driver straight to one iron. Oh, so, so, so I did have experience with it and it was an amazing experience with this thing. I still, I can't believe I, I don't have that still. Can I ask you how far you carry the old school one iron back in the day? In oh, Utah? in Utah, I was feeling like 300 yards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Oh yeah. Driver. Hell yeah. There's when I was a kid, there was no holding back. It was, you know, we all hit the high slinger, you know, it was, um, no problem. 300 yards. But so I, that was the one club I've ever hit of ping. But outside of that, I never, you know, never used ping. So I was going through all the different club manufacturers. I had them send me, send me clubs. I wanted to try everything just to clear my conscience to know that I truly have tried everything. And then I get to pick what I think is going to be best for me. I went to Scott, uh, I went to Phoenix, went to headquarters uh, at ping. And it was just a bucket list item thing or um, a listing where I just wanted to knock ping off the list just so I know in my conscience that I tried ping and I can get rid of them. As soon as I start hitting these eye blades, like it was like this light went off in my head. I was like, are you serious? These things are, these clubs are that good. So then I hit the, you know, then I hit the woods, then I hit the driver and I was like, all right, this is unbelievable. Like <laughs> so I didn't knew, try you knew, any, you knew right I knew, there. I knew right there. I said, I'm, I'm playing ping. So I had them, I played eye blades for the rest of 17 and then, and then the rest of 18. And at the end of 18 is when they came out with the blueprints. And I put the blueprints straight in. And I've been playing the same set of blueprints since 2018. So it was it's quite a cool story that way where I truly did try almost every club manufacturer. And for me, um, Ping was the best. Yeah. Tony, I don't even know if you know this, but you also helped kicked off this idea where anyone who gets fit at Ping now marries their golf ball to their driver. Mm. Because we remember the G400 Max driver. Yeah. You hit that thing awesome. Yeah, I did. And uh, But I remember that story where it was spinning a little too much. Yeah. And instead of changing the driver, because you didn't want to take loft off it, that's when we started playing that left out ball. That's right. So we actually kind of used that as inspiration. Oh, nice. I start personally use the left out <laughs> ball because it's the same – same yeah. thing, but we use that as inspiration. Now everybody marries ball and club and together. Club, yeah, you know, thanks to you. I love that. Oh, so well, good. Happy I could help. Uh, maybe ask. Maybe ask for a bonus at the end of this <laughs> yeah, year. Maybe yeah. ask for like a slight contract <laughs> bonus. Hey guys, if you guys just throw a little bit more, you talk about your best years are ahead of you, Tony. What's left? Like, what do you do? You write down goals every year. Do you have that in mind, or you just go out and try to play because you feel like such a cerebral guy? Like you're just going out there and trying to have some fun and play some good golf. Yeah, and that's a. Uh... I think that's the crazy thing, you know, sometimes the misconception of either the nice guy or well, whatever the case. But I I don't think anybody at any level is great or successful without um, – without, Being a bit of a dog. Without being a dog, but without, a dog. without having a plan, yeah. you know, and without um, executing it, without 
having the work ethic, all those, all the things that come with being great at something. So, um, I could see how I come off that way, but a hundred percent, you know, I make, I make goals every year and, and this year, um, you know, my, my goal moving forward in my career is to win major championships, okay. you know, and that's where I feel like I'm at in the process of my career. Um, and of course you want to set yourself up every week to win. I want to win many more times on the PGA tour. Um, but major championships are what, the great players win and to put myself in that category i need to win some so uh i don't want to win one i don't want to win two i want to win a few of them yeah. so um i my biggest thing is number one stay healthy i think i've been fortunate in my career up to this point i'm about to start my 10th season i haven't had any major injuries so i think that that's extremely important for me for the next dozen years of my career yeah i think if that's the case i'm going to have a chance to win some major championships so my health i would say is at the very top um, and if, if I'm healthy, I think for the next dozen years, then, then I move to the golf portion of it and make sure that no stone is unturned when it comes to my game and trying to continue to progress, continue to improve and, and, and knock off some major championships in my, in my career. What do you do? What do you do from, uh, investment side on your time investment on your fitness side to make sure you stay injury free? Yeah. And how does Boyd weave into that or swing mechanics and things of that nature? Yeah, well... Boy, it doesn't um, doesn't help me a lot with uh, with uh, nutrition or with uh, uh, working out or anything. You know, I've got uh, a trainer that I use, Stuart Love. I've been with him for seven years. Nice. So he's he's been a huge help as far as that department goes. Um, with the lifestyle that I have on the road, it's a lot easier for me to work out honestly than than when I'm at home because I'm with my kids a lot. Yeah. You know, we're together all the time when I'm home. Um, I have to sprinkle it in before they wake up, late at night. You know, so. It's it's just it's just making sure I get it in when I can, you know, and it's but it's a, it's the most important thing that you have, you know, our, is our health. So um, I know that that's the case for me. And um, I try to stay on top of it. My diet has gotten better, I would say, every year and every season of my career, just because, you know, you don't want that old age to mm. slow you down, you know. And so I've tried to eat better. I've tried different types of diets to see how my body reacts to it. And um, again, just trying to figure out. Um, all of that, but um, I've worked hard to stay in shape, and 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 you have to at this level to be to be any good. What's your current diet thought right now? Where, where are we at right now, Tony? Yeah, so I I, I was on the carnivore diet for six weeks. I okay. just stopped that a couple of weeks ago. So that's and just saw, that's just meat and vegetables. No, it's just meat. Just meat. Yeah. <laughs> Skip the vegetables. Yeah. Sorry, no so, vegetables. Sorry, so real quick, what is the breakfast like? What's breakfast? Yeah. So I I, I would eat a. I only had two meals. Okay. A sixteen. So for breakfast, I'd eat a sixteen ounce ribeye. Okay. About three strips of bacon, and either like a chicken thigh or like two or three eggs. This is awesome. And then I would only eat beef jerky throughout my like okay. while I, while I practice. And then at night, I'd have like maybe some lamb chops and like a couple strips of bacon. Yeah. And then true carnivores, there's like levels to this, and I don't want to get too far, too deep into right, it. Right, right. True carnivores only eat beef, which oh, is from yeah. the cow. Gotcha. And they'll eat nose to tail, meaning everything. Okay. Um, I'm not extreme like that. <laughs> I like, uh, I thought it was hard enough just to <laughs> only eat say. meat, you know? So I, I, I'm fine with, you know, adding pork and I ate lamb and I ate chicken and fish, you know, so I was kind of the next level down from the extreme carnivores. Um, but I thought there was a lot of great things to it. You know, I, I lost 12 pounds, but it mostly you cut out carbs um, and, and vegetables and um, and sugars, you know, and so I thought that I thought it was great. I took what I liked from it and am now into a different phase where, you know, I, I like fruits way too much to just totally get rid of them. I think it's the greatest greatest source of sugar that you could have. So I've had I've now added fruit and some vegetables back into my back into my diet. But it was a it was a good diet while it lasted. I I thought is, it had some great benefits. Is it easy for you to stay disciplined with that stuff? Are you good about that? I yeah, I am pretty disciplined when it comes to that because I wanna I truly wanna understand if it's working for me or gotcha. not. Yeah. yeah, I wanna see what's really happening to my body. If I'm not disciplined enough, I'm not really gonna understand if it's actually working. Totally. So for six straight for four straight weeks, I was hardcore carnivore. For the two weeks after that, I added fruit because I felt I actually felt like I had to, like my I, I think my sugar levels, my glucose, and this is again I was in the middle of the season. Like I probably shouldn't be trying this stuff <laughs> like that and being that disciplined, but there's never really a good time to to try well, you, it. You I guys think. haven't had an off season in like yeah, 25 exactly, yeah, years, so now you're yeah, about to have exactly. one. Exactly. So good news. I'll take some time off this fall. 
it's one of the fun things I've loved, Tony, about having you and, and other players on is how much you guys do experiment. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like self-experimentation, whether it's on diet, routine, swing, training aids, you yeah. name it. You know, you got to take a little bit of risk once in a while and experiment. And I would say um, guys aren't scared to change. I think they truly know. Um, again, they're stubborn enough to know how good they are and great at what they do. And, and if they think something is going to be better for them, then they're not they're not scared to try it. Tony, how's the sneaker collection? Is it? Is yeah, it, it's pretty. Is it extensive? It's pretty good. It's not that extensive. I I do have a pretty nice Jordan collection, but it's mostly AJ ones, high tops and low tops. Okay. Um, some fives, some elevens. Um, because I only collect the ones I'm actually going to wear. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think I, that's I'm fair. not like a Jordan guy where it's like I have the one through thirteen and you know all the different color waves. I actually get the shoes I wear. Right. Right. So yeah, but it's pretty solid. You know, thanks to Nike and, <laughs> and Jordan, I you know I get the get shoes for free, so it's kind of nice. Tony, you're the man. We appreciate you taking some time. Uh, keep crushing it. Fun to watch. Fun to listen to you chat about it too. I mean, appreciate what a unique it. journey. It's been uh, it's been fun to watch. I, I'm, you know what I'm excited to see too. I'm excited to see Preston playing golf with yeah. you and Rom all the time. Yeah, exactly. What it's going to look like when he turns professional. That's right. Very different journey, but we appreciate exactly. the time so much. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for having Tony. me. Thanks.